Welcome, my dear friends, to 2019. We are once again into the future. <laughs> now, last week I started a series called I've Seen Some Unsettling Things as a Truck Driver, and it proved so popular that I've decided to do Volume 2 already. Now, you might be able to hear in my voice, I'm a little bit ill at the moment, but it doesn't matter to me. I'm pressing on with some more stories for you. So, more around the theme of driving and trucking this evening, so I hope you'll do me one favor at the start of the year. Sit back and relax with your favorite drink, and listen. Well, first of all, I'd like to apologize for not writing more frequently than I do. <laughs> with the nature of my work, I work long hours, and I'm by no means a writer. Sometimes I simply don't feel like writing down my stories, much less having to relive them. This incident took place not too long after the second one, and thinking back on it to this day, given someone else experienced it with me, I am certain that I'm not crazy. I was traveling through Arizona late one night because I had an early morning delivery and chose to drive overnight because usually there's less traffic and as long as you don't stop too frequently, you can usually get farther driving through the night than during the day. I'd recently got a dog, which I'd named Banjo. <laughs> yes, it's my favorite instrument. I'd picked him up from the animal shelter where I live, and he's a great dog for the road, and an excellent navigator. Dogs also seem to have an innate sense for when things just aren't right, which plays into this story a bit later. I've been driving for about nine of my eleven hours, and was set to arrive at the customer in a little over a half hour, leaving me plenty of time to drop and hook, then find a place to get some shutter. Well, let's just say I didn't arrive to that customer at the appointment time. I like to think of myself as a good-hearted person, which is why when I saw a car on its side, off to the side of the road, frame and metal twisted, I pulled over to check and make sure everyone was okay. I pulled over, set the brakes, hopped out, and put out my emergency reflective triangles, then immediately rushed over to the car. Banjo began to growl very subtly. The driver's door was blocked against the ground. The windshield was smashed but not completely shattered, no doubt thanks to the laminated glass used for front windshields. There was blood all around the driver area, and possessions strewn all around the car. I walked around to the other side of the mangled vehicle, and saw blood dripping from the passenger door and onto the ground. Nobody was in sight, and I couldn't see any footprints or blood trails with my flashlight. I immediately called 911 afterwards, gave them the location and a description of the scene, and told them I couldn't find the driver, but that there was blood leading off the vehicle. I kept searching around until, finally, I saw the emergency lights. I walked over to the officer's patrol vehicle, informed him in more detail what I'd seen, and being that the ambulance they called was still some time away, we decided to search for the driver of the vehicle. Although Arizona is an arid climate, it still gets very cold at night. There are many things out in the desert that remind you that, out here, you are not on top of the food chain. So it was vital that we found the driver. We began branching off in a V-shaped pattern. He went left, and I went right. We stayed just close enough that we could use the faint speck of a flashlight to signal if one of us found the driver. Now, well, about five minutes went by. I hadn't found the driver yet, and the officer hadn't singled with his light either. Then, we heard a very faint noise. I couldn't tell what it was at first, but it subtly grew in intensity. It was the most ominous sound I'd ever heard. So much so that I can't begin to describe what it sounded like. After about ten seconds of listening to the sound and feeling the adrenaline kick in, I could hear my dog barking like mad back at my truck, and then a woman's scream. The officer must have heard that too, as we both pointed our flashlights at each other and ran to meet in the middle. We linked back up, 
He asked me if I'd heard the scream. I told him I had. I looked down and... There was a bloody footprint on the ground, leading farther off into the desert. It was definitely recent. The blood hadn't begun to coagulate yet. We began hastily following the footprints. The more we followed, the more blood we saw. At this point, we were easily a thousand feet away from the scene of the accident. And then, the footprints just... stopped. It was like they were never there. We searched in a circle around them, but could find no more. We walked back a bit towards the accident, and the only prints were mine and the officers. We were dumbfounded. Then we heard the voice. It was a woman's voice. It said, Did you come all this way looking for me? Oh, I'm sorry. I've had an accident. Soon, you will too. That kicked the adrenaline into overdrive, and I instinctively began backing away. The officer shone his light all around and said, Ma'am, if you are injured, you need to come out so we can get you medical attention. I was still slightly backing away. And then I saw the officer's leg getting torn into by, well, by nothing. There was nothing there. He cried in pain. It was deep, but not debilitating. He had the same reaction I did. We started into a full-on sprint to get back to our vehicles. My muscles were firing on all cylinders. The officer and I were side by side. My lungs and legs were on fire. I heard something closing in behind us. Banjo was going berserk. I thought for sure I wasn't going to make it. The damn thing sounded like it was right behind us. It was toying with us, losing ground and then gaining it back. We made it back to the scene of the accident. And I heard that ominous sound once again. Trying to regain our breath, we both realized that the car was gone. There was no vehicle in sight there. No blood, no broken pieces, no glass. Just my truck and his patrol car. I heard the thing that was chasing us slowly recede back into the desert. Both of us were so full of adrenaline we were shaking. and The blood was beginning to soak into his uniform. He grabbed the first aid kit out of his cruiser, and I helped him patch up the wound. The ambulance arrived ten minutes later, to the scene of an accident that wasn't there. Knowing that no one would believe us, we made up the story that I'd had to stop because my engine was overheating, and on the way to my truck, to make sure I was alright, the officer slipped and fell, catching his leg on a rock. They ended up taking the officer to the hospital. I found out later that when he got there, it was like he had an infection. They had to remove the infected tissue. He ended up needing 22 stitches afterwards. Oh, call me superstitious. But I believe that talking about evil things gives that evil a pass back into your world. Which is why this is the only time I've ever told this particular story. And why I never will again. First of all, I'll say, I got lost while I was adventuring in the Nevada desert. I wasn't even supposed to be out here, but <laughs> life is life, right? Let me start off from the very beginning. I was driving down a highway in a desert of Nevada. Didn't know where I was just yet. I was running low on gas, and I needed to find a gas station, and fast. But there was none in sight. Well, that was, until I saw it. It was old, but, well, I thought, it doesn't hurt to try. I pulled up right by the gas pumps that were so ancient. I looked through the window, thinking I was seeing the inside of a wreck. But 
wasn't at all that. The place looked as if it was new. Oh, looked like I was beginning out of this wasteland after all. I walked in, and the smell was fantastic, unlike any other. I then noticed a man, who was sitting on a stool in front of the register. I walked over, said hello, and asked him where I was. This is what he told me. You're in the Nevada desert, of course. After learning where I was, I then asked him, How do I get out of the desert? He looked at me and smiled. Why would you want to leave? You can stay here forever. It was at this moment that I knew that this man wasn't right. I paid him the money to get the gas, and I was on my way. After pulling off the road, all I could think about was how strange that man was. It was about six more miles from that lonely gas station when I noticed something strange. It was another gas station, but it looked exactly like the one with the strange man. I was just going to go past it, but my curiosity got the best of me. I stopped right outside and went in. It was the same place. I don't know how that was. I was going to leave when I noticed him sitting in the stool in front of the register. It was him. I don't know how, but it was him. He looked at me and smiled. Then he said, Well, well, well. Looks like you just couldn't leave me. I didn't know what to say. I was in front of the impossible. All I could do was run out of the gas station and get into my car and drive off. While I was driving, all I could hope was not to see that dreaded gas station again. But to my terror, there it was, right in front of me, the old gas station. I was going to pass it up this time. Maybe that would fix whatever was happening. Now, been driving for so long, I've lost track of time. I noticed that I was running low on gas. My car could stop at any second. And there it was. The gas station. I definitely didn't want my car to stop right out front. But that's what happens, I guess. I had to suck up my fears and go inside. I walked in, and it was exactly like the first one I'd seen. It even had the man on the stool. But this time, I pulled up a stool right alongside him. And I asked him, Why is this happening to me? I know you must be the reason. He looked at me and told me, So, you want all this to end? Yes. How? Well, that's for you to find out. I didn't know what to do. I picked up a chair and hit the man with it. He didn't even flinch. After hitting him, he stood up and turned to face me. Why would you do such a thing? He asked me. I didn't know what to say. He then grabbed me by the neck and lifted me off the ground. His eyes turned red. What he told me next gave me the truth. I'd been looking for. He looked me right in the eye as he told me. Boy, you're in hell, and you will suffer forever. Who are you? I asked him while he was choking me. I am Satan, and you will never escape hell. And then he snapped my neck, and I woke up in my car still driving. I gained control of the wheel. <laughs> it was all just a dream. Thank God for that. And then, I noticed it. An old gas station with those ancient gas pumps.
When Todd awoke, he was lying on a blanket of dead pine needles. Above him, he could see stars between a canopy of tree branches. Groggily, he sat up and rubbed his eyes. Where was he? What time was it? The last thing he remembered was driving on the dirt road near his house. The night air was cool and fragrant. He could hear the call of an owl in the distance, and a chorus of crickets chirped around him. He felt in his pockets for a cell phone, or anything else useful, but found them empty. Since he was completely and utterly lost, he figured there was nothing other to do than to begin walking, and hope he encountered civilization. His legs felt heavy, as if they were made of lead, but he strained to lift them, and gradually the feeling disappeared. He was frustrated to find that whatever forest he was in was dense enough and large enough that he was unable to see anything other than trees in any direction. He tried to find some bearing among the stars, but they seemed odd and unrecognizable. The moon was even more jarringly strange. It seemed larger than normal, and something about the perspective of it, or perhaps some other feature, was so unusual it seemed if perhaps it was a different moon than the one he was familiar with altogether. Todd resolved to just pick a direction and continue onwards. After all, he was bound to reach something eventually. Todd kept hoping that he was dreaming, that he would wake up in his bed and return to his mundane life. Sure, he'd been struggling after his recent breakup, and sure, he'd been drinking a lot recently to cope. But all of his problems seemed so trivial. At least, he was familiar with it all, and he knew things would get better eventually. Wherever he now was, and whatever was happening, they were terrifyingly unknown. Todd recalled getting lost once before, when he was young. Back then, he'd lived with his parents in a house that was close to a dense national forest. They'd adopted him as a baby, after his biological mother had died in a car crash. He'd been given a lot of freedom as a child, and the woods were his favourite place to play. One day, he dared to venture into them further than he had ever before. He was feeling adventurous, and though he was vaguely afraid that he wouldn't be able to find his way back home, his adolescent mind calculated that as long as he kept walking the same way, he could always walk the opposite way to get back. He remembered encountering a clearing, and finding a deer standing in it. He'd been in awe of it. To him, it had looked so big and powerful. Its fur looked soft and silky, and Todd had wished he could pet it. The deer was unfazed by his presence, and his eyes studied the boy. Eventually, it grew bored, and bounded off back into the trees. After the shock and glee had worn off, Todd realized that he couldn't recall which way he'd been walking. He panicked and began screaming, tears streaming down his face. He began running pointlessly through the undergrowth, tripping several times on protruding roots and rocks. His eyes were clamped shut. When he opened them, by some miracle, he found he could see his house in the distance. Todd had always liked to think that he'd had a guardian angel, or something of the sort, that had protected him that day. But where was his angel now? After he walked for what seemed like ages, the forest was still thick and unyielding around him. The feeling in his legs had long since returned, but this time at least he could place exhaustion as the cause. He'd nearly given up hope, but his ears picked up a sound they hadn't noticed before. It sounded like music coming from somewhere off in the distance. Elated, Todd began bounding in the direction he heard it come from. It grew louder as the trees began to thin, and he started to make out a brightly lit building in the distance. As he drew nearer, it became clear that the building was a diner. When he reached the front doors, he saw people inside. The place seemed to be bustling with activity. As he entered, a little bell rang, and he could see some patrons seated at booths and tables. Others were dancing around an old jukebox playing loudly in the corner, which must have been where he'd heard the music coming from. Just seat yourself, hon, a voice called from somewhere behind the front counter. Todd welcomed the opportunity to rest his weary muscles and sat down on one of the brightly coloured bench seats. After a moment, a waitress approached with a table. Can I get you started with something to drink? She asked cheerfully. Todd couldn't place it, 
but something about her felt odd, even malevolent. She looked like a perfectly nice middle-aged lady. Her auburn hair was slightly grey, and her uniform was pastel pink in colour, but he couldn't suppress the sense that something was wrong. Um, maybe some water, thanks, he said shakily. The waitress nodded, gave him a smile, and was about to retreat behind the counter again. But he spoke and said, Oh, wait, actually, I'm afraid I don't know where I am. Is it all right if I use your phone? Of course, hon, she replied. Come up to the counter. You can use the one there. He walked over, and she pulled out a rotary phone and sat it next to him. Todd was surprised. He hadn't seen one of those in years. Oh, well, he thought. I suppose it works just as well as any other phone. He picked it up and decided to dial his brother. He lived only a few minutes away from Todd, and while Todd had no clue where in the world he was, so that fact wasn't helpful, he concluded his brother was probably the best person he could rely on to come pick him up. He realised, as the phone rang, that he didn't even know where to tell his brother he was located, and he shouted for the waitress, but she either didn't hear him or didn't pay him any mind. After several rings, someone seemed to answer on the other end, but nothing came out of the receiver but static. He frowned and tried calling again, then calling his mother, both with the same result. Even calling emergency services yielded nothing. Dejectedly, he put the phone down. Todd pondered his options. He could wait for the waitress to return and ask her directions, he supposed, or... He could leave and simply begin walking in the direction he'd been headed before, and hope to find somewhere with a working means of communication. He eventually reasoned that he might as well at least ask the waitress if she could give him directions before blindly heading out into the darkness again. He sat back down and closed his eyes. He was tired. So very tired. He became aware, however, that the feeling of dread within him was growing. Something about the music coming from the jukebox seemed more sinister than before, and, opening his eyes, the dancers seemed more frantic, rapidly swinging and stepping around, almost as if they would die if they stopped moving. The diner, before strongly lit, was now filled with dark and undulating shadows. He felt his chest seize up, and his breathing became shallow and laboured. Sweat began dripping down his forehead, no, this is wrong. This is all wrong, he whispered. The people seated at the other booths and tables were all smiling. They were all smiling at him. With a shriek, he darted out the doors. Todd didn't know where he was running to, nor did he care. He only wished to be further from that god-forsaken diner. Around him, the forest, before filled with vitality, was almost totally silent. More he could hear were his heavy footsteps. The air felt colder, almost frigid. He closed his eyes, just as he had years before, and prayed. He suddenly heard a rushing noise as he was propelling himself forward, and stopped abruptly. At first, he couldn't quite place what it was. However, when he opened his eyes, he was delighted to find that he could see a highway less than a hundred yards away. He exclaimed in joy, but as he began sprinting towards the road, his movement became slower and slower, as his body was gripped by fatigue. He was so close. His mind began to get foggy as well. If only he rested for a few minutes, Todd thought. He could make it the rest of the way. He lay down on the ground and mused to himself that the pine needles made a nice surface for him to get some rest on. As he drifted off, he thought he could hear a voice saying, Sir, can you hear me, sir? Todd lay broken and battered. Blood seeped out of the lacerations covering his body as the kind woman who'd stopped to help called to him. She'd pulled over when she saw his car smashed into a tree on the side of the road. He had been ejected through the windshield, the glass cutting his skin and his bones had fractured as he landed. His eyes were open, and as the life faded from them, 
A slight smile spread across his face. So I managed to get the stories recorded before uh, my cold came on too badly, so if I sound a bit worse in the introduction and now in the uh, end credits, then there's a good reason for that. But I've made it through and hopefully I'll be feeling better by Friday when, of course, I will have another story coming up for you. Until then, I think I need a bit of a break and uh, a bit of nice tea, I think. He's the voice. Well, <laughs> that's enough for me for one evening. You all have fun out there and enjoy the new year. But for now... Sweet dreams and bye bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Doctor Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay? <laughs>